So, um, a good day to everybody. What a pleasure it is to be sort of back again and, and working with uh, Friends of Xibia India again. So thank you very much for the, first of all, the kind introduction. Uh, thank you for the organizing team of setting this up. Uh, it's amazing. But thank you, um, attendants, even more for being here. Uh, because not, nothing of this would be uh, meaningful or making sense without uh, people willing to listen, to learn, and show openness to learn and get uh, new insights. That's really beautiful. Um, and and that, that's maybe in a way already a little introduction to uh, the, the theme of the day, of the event today is about something with metrics. And I've translated that into my world of Scrum, my, my world of uh, empiricism, and a way of managing um, that is quite different than, I believe, what we used to do. And I like to call that exploratory management of value. And there's a couple of aspects in that. But let me, let me first introduce, indeed, thank you, uh, Xiva, for introducing and, and promoting my, my book so much. Um, and, and, and I indeed wanted to share some exciting news first, because indeed, uh, since only since last week, my book is now available via the Computer Bookshop India, where you can have it in a, in a let's say, a, in a, a more affordable price in a self-printed way. So uh, my friends of Kiva will be sharing the links. Uh, but please, if you're looking for my book and you're living on the Indian subcontinent somewhere, uh, you can get my book via the Computer Bookshop uh, India. So thank you very much. It's amazing to have my book available around the world in, in, and certainly with this uh, new channel. Um, in the meantime, that reminds me also, um, once upon a time, and I still maintain that, I created two texts around Scrum. Uh, one is a Scrum glossary, meaning a glossary, a, a list of words of Scrum, key terms of Scrum, and a little explanation. But also texts about the Scrum values. And uh, those two texts, uh, th there are separate web websites for them, by the way. They have been translated in the meantime to over 20 languages, including Hindi, including Bengali and so on. And now there's two people, I believe they are attending the session. So let me, let me um, uh, say my thanks to them publicly, Mahesh and Rahul Jade, uh, for working on the translation of those two texts into Marathi. And there's a couple of the, the most beautiful language around the world. I don't understand them, but I truly appreciate the effort that people go to in translating my work. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, it's amazing to see my work available around the world. <clears throat> now, I, I wanted to start this session with thinking about metrics and, and, and uh, taking a step back. As was said during the introduction, um, I truly believe in Scrum being a really great instrument to humanize the workplace, create more humane, professional working environment for people. And that starts by accepting, acknowledging, embracing, even cherishing the fact that it's all about human beings. And as human beings, a scarf is what we all need. A scarf is from... Um, Neuroscience and, 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 and psychology, it stands for status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness, SCARF. So it's, a, it's an acronym. Um, those are things we all need as human beings. And, and some of you might know Daniel Pink, who wrote a book, uh, What Truly Motivates People. And he highlighted, in a way, three elements of those five things of SCARF. And the first status he translated in a professional working environment, certainly in a knowledge creation environment, he translated that into mastery. And that's, that's, that's not too bad, let's say. Um, I, like, I like to see it more as skills. So um, status in that sense, being acknowledged for, somebody, for being somebody who's able to actually do something, to, to add something, to contribute. Yeah? And I, I like it, maybe mastery skill, uh, maybe the neuroscience talks more about competence. So in a professional environment status, it's, it's, it's something that emerges from competence, having skills or acquiring mastery. And, and we know about uh, Daniel Pink, he got the element of autonomy. And then uh, what he called, what, what we would generally call relatedness, he translated that into purpose. Uh, I've been told by people that contributed to my, my book, 97 Things Every Scrum Practitioner Should Know, people that are more into neuroscience, uh, they say, well, purpose is not really uh, most scientific term, so we like to call it relatedness. 
And I, 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 I embrace that. I love that. I, I like to call it skills of competence. Skills in that sense is a little bit better because it keeps intact the acronym, let's say. But I want to talk today and I want to start today with thinking about relatedness. Uh, what do we need as human beings to really prosper and feel well and, and to thrive? Um, and that's what Daniel Pink says, what truly motivates people. One of the aspects is what he calls purpose. Let's call it in general relatedness. The ability to relate to something, uh, to contribute to something that is something meaningful. They have this idea that I'm, I'm delivering a contribution to, let's say, a sort of higher purpose, uh, something that I can relate to as a human being. So, and that's also important as a professional. Now, as a professional, uh, the problem for me is the following, talking in terms of relatedness. Um, I am often astonished by how many organizations are clueless about why they actually exist. What is your mission? What is your mission statement? Um, what is your purpose? Why, why do you exist as an organization, as an enterprise? Can you explain that to me? It's, 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 it, it seems to be a very, very difficult question because I hardly ever get a meaningful answer. And, and, and making money, that might be a motivation. It's not really a great mission statement, but it seems to boil down to that for most organizations. And that is, that is okay, uh, so maybe not being completely clueless, but it's, I, I don't think it's the most driving uh, motivator, let's say, in terms of relatedness. I like to see things in terms of what positive change do we try to bring to the world? <clears throat> now, talking for myself, being that one person company, uh, Ulysses Inc., whatever, but it's just me, I call myself an independent scrum caretaker. Um, my, my, what I discovered throughout the years, my reason of being, it, it all it revolves around people for me, human beings. It's also this session. And, and, um, in that sense, I'm driven by this idea to uh, humanize the workplace with Scrum, create more humane environments. So think about it for your organization, your enterprise, what is your reason of existence? And that is important because if you can't explain your reason of existence, how can you then explain why you are introducing Scrum? What are, what are you adopting Scrum for? Because if you don't know why you exist, and then you can't create relatedness of Scrum and your organization, and you can't create relatedness for the people working at your organization. So why are you using Scrum? To make more money? I don't know, but this is my opening question in general. When I talk to management teams or CXO people, uh, CXO workshops, whatever, why are we here? In that sense, you invited me to come talk about and guide you to some uh, essentials or whatever. It depends a little bit on the time I'm giving, but why are we here? And I mean, why are we in this session? In that sense, why have you invited me to come talk about Scrum? It might be, it might start with um, understanding your urgency. What problems are you trying to fix? What are your biggest challenges? Why, why are you adopting Scrum? So, so two ways of looking at why you're adopting Scrum. Maybe adopting Scrum to improve and your uh, mission statement, why do you exist? Maybe your values as an enterprise, fixing some problems. I hope those two are connected, by the way. We have problems in achieving our mission statement, but a lot of organizations are clueless. And, and as you can see, there's this ripple effect. Not being able to explain why your organization exists means why are building certain products why are you uh, undertaking certain activities, projects, endeavors, and so on? And in the end, why are you adopting Scrum? So being clueless has an effect, not in the least on the people that are involved in the adoption of Scrum. Because Scrum cannot be the purpose of Scrum. You can't introduce Scrum because of Scrum. You have to think about why Scrum. So, so let me let me try to give you my perspective on that and, and i'm just a single one person um so uh, uh, most of organizations decide not to take my advice seriously uh, but you never know so so scrum if i look at scrum and have a look at our scrum communities and uh, what annoys me and it truly annoys me how stuck we are on interpreting the rules of scrum all the time and that means the rules of Scrum are described in the Scrum Guide. 
I've elaborated, I've tried to elaborate in my books, Scrum A Pocket Guide, I also kindly introduced and now available via the Computer Bookshop India. I've tried to elaborate a lot on the purpose of the rules. I've tried to elaborate and make clear the distinction between the rules of Scrum and tactics to apply the rules. In that sense, you've got the rules of the game and you've got tactics to play the game. Those are separate. In the Scrum Guide, we describe the rules and we leave open how to apply those rules. Now, what astonished me, astonishes me around the world, um, within organizations, in communities, at events, people are having endless, 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 endless debates about the rules of Scrum, meaning interpretations of the Scrum Guide, words, word games, uh, why is a hyphen over there? Why is there not a... Uh, a, a or whatever, a, a, a comma over there. And so it drives me crazy. People losing so much time discussing, debating the rules of Scrum. So last year I wrote a paper to help people get over that. I actually called it moving your Scrum downfield. Now start doing something with Scrum. Um, that also brings in what I call Scrum's DNA, meaning the combination of empiricism and self-organization. And I've described the Scrum values. So, so rather than being stuck on interpreting the rule, um, try also to, to think about what, what drives Scrum, what, what the underlying foundations of Scrum, meaning self-organization, empiricism, plus the Scrum values that are about behavior. But today, let's talk about relatedness. And in that sense, why are you, why are you doing Scrum? And that might be in, maybe in your particular definition of what do you call Scrum? Yeah. So, so the purpose of Scrum, let me, let me share my definition of Scrum. That's the definition I used in that paper, moving your Scrum downfield. And I call Scrum a simple framework that enables people to derive value from complex challenges. It is in a way in tune with that statement you see on the screen from the Agile Manifesto. And that same says it's sort of the first principle of the Agile Manifesto saying our highest priority of the Agile of the Agile Manifesto and thereby, I hope, of the Agile movement around the world. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Now, in the meantime, Scrum is so big and so hugely adopted around the world that it's not, no longer just about software. It's no longer just about software products. It's no longer just about software projects or not even just products or projects. It's about tackling complex challenges. So in that sense, my uh, definition goes a little bit uh, higher, even a little bit higher up than statements from the actual uh, manifesto, but still much in tune, much in tune also with what the Scrum Guide says. In that sense, it means value is our purpose. And value for me is a very different thing than volume. So think about volume is doing more, 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 more. Value means having an impact thinking in terms of importance, not just uh, keeping up the rat race, which is again part of my journey of humanizing the, the, the workplace. Stopping, finally putting a halt to the rat race by stopping to focus on volume and shift towards value. And that, that's important. So that is important, but now how to do that? And, and, and this is probably one of the, one of the first ever acronyms that I, I created. I'm, I'm not that creative in a way. So how to arm for value then? If value is the purpose, if that creates relatedness, how to arm for value using Scrum? Well, three things. I like, I like often to see things in, in, in combinations of three. I don't know why. Maybe it's something in my brain, but at least. Arming for value means assigning value. That means thinking about your product backlog or looking at your product backlog in terms of value. That might mean value by assigning it on product backlog items, like you would assign or estimate effort on product backlog items, assign value to product backlog items. You can use very, very similar techniques. You can use relative value, absolute value, and so on. Uh, you can use a uh, long time ago, when I was still working with the uh, ING in the Netherlands, uh, I, I, I asked product owners to do something that I called value poker. So rather than planning poker for estimate, but value poker. But at least the first thing, arm for value means you have to think about what is value for us. So that, that automatically brings you, if you want to assign value on your product backlog items, you have to think about what is value for us. If your organization is clueless, 
about its mission, its statement, its users, whatever. If you're using Scrum without thinking about what are we using Scrum for? Is it hopefully product services and so on? Then you're probably going to be clueless about value too. So that, that, that will surface all of that. It wouldn't solve it, but at least assign value. And then release, in Scrum terms, release your increments. In that sense, start closing the feedback loop with your users, with your consumers, with buyers, whatever. But releasing in itself is not enough. You can just release and that's it. That's a way to close the feedback loop, but the feedback loop will not be closed until you start measuring. What is the impact we have on our consumer base, on our customer base, within the enterprise, beyond the enterprise, and so on. So how to arm for value, assign value, release, so that you can measure. And those three things need to take place. Now, um, assigning value, um, I, like, I like personally to think more in terms of assuming value. Make an assumption of value on your product backlog. And the assumption needs to be validated by releasing and then measuring. So an assumption locally starts with an A, so I can keep intact my, uh, my little acronym. Now, there's one important thing. I call this exploratory management, meaning exploration of value, managing for the exploration of value. It's, it's how to manage in an empirical environment. So we establish an empirical environment with Scrum. Now, it's very important in an empirical environment or as a basis for exploratory management that measurements, so the last step of arming for value, are not targets. They are not old school KPIs. They are not must have whatever. They are what they are measurements, indications of a situation. Yeah. Whatever the situation is, good or bad, you want, you want to have transparency, you want to inspect reality, you want your measurements to reflect reality out there, beyond your organization, within your organization. But what is even more, that's where it starts, what is also important and maybe even more important, you want to, in a, in a, in a changing, dynamic, complex, unpredictable environment, you want to look at trends more than just singular data points. That means the following, how to arm for value, assume value, uh, release your increments so that you can measure the impact that you're having with your uh, increments. By assuming value, by the way, that is already included in um, ordering your product backlog, thinking about importance, impact, and so on. You want to validate whether your assumption of, of impact on your product backlog is correct. And like I just said, you don't want to do this once, you want to do this repeatedly so that you create feedback loops that you close regularly and that you, that you capture, that you collect multiple data points so that you can see trends through those points. Compare it to burn out charts, burn up charts and so on. So that is, that is really important. Now, how to actually do this in a context of Scrum? Uh, we've got a beautiful event for that. It's called the Sprint Review. So exploratory management of value Important perspective, I believe, to the sprint review. You know, the sprint review, the event where the product owner connects live, um, interacts with, connects um, stakeholders, key use, potentially key buyers, potentially consumers of the product, and, and, and the development team, or what we now call the developers. So they're all in the same room. Nowadays, I know that's all virtually, but still we are also virtually connected here. So uh, you, you can do that remote, but in a sense, they're all in the same physical or virtual room. Um, and, and they're having, hopefully, um, they're bringing in information, they're bringing in feedback. And I hope your sprint reviews are about inspecting for potential impact. That might be impact or potential impact. Let me explain. It means you're looking at the increment, the way the, the sprint went and so on, but you're looking at the increment. And I hope your perspective to the increment is not, uh, did everybody perform the, his or her tasks? Was it according to the estimates made, um, sort of individual performance in a sprint? No. In Scrum, the minimal units, the units to look at Scrum from an external perspective, meaning not being in the Scrum team, so not being the product owner, not being the Scrum master, not being the developers or the group of developers or the development team. Um, for all of those people, the units to look at Scrum are a sprint, not days, 
not estimates, what, not hours spent, whatever, not days, but a sprint. That's a unit of time. And, and, and the unit of, of people, let's say, is the team, the team as a whole. Yeah? And what you want to know is not volume, but value. And that is a very different perspective than I see happening at a lot of sprint reviews. So, so thinking about value, impact, importance, I hope your sprint reviews are about inspecting for that potential value, that potential impact that you are creating as a team. And not about uh, estimates, individual performance, volume, um, velocity, all those um, all those things that might be important, but not, not really adding value to thinking in terms of value. So that, that is for me really, really important. And the idea of this idea of introducing or making your sprint reviews revolve around value is to get people's focus eyes away from the performance of the team, individual performance, let's say sort of how, how well the engine is performing towards yeah. Are we driving in the right direction? Are there any big blockages or, uh, on the road that we can see coming ahead? How often do we have to stop, start again and, and try to remove them? So um, what is the impact that we are creating with our users, with our consumer base? Is our customer satisfaction sort of out the trend lines of customer satisfaction or other parameters? That is for me the goal of the sprint review. And it's for potential value or for value in that sense, as you know, you can produce multiple increments throughout the sprint. The minimum expectation of Scrum is to have at least one releasable, observable piece of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of an increment, of a product, of a service under the form of an increment by the end of sprint. That's the minimal requirement. Obviously, you can produce multiple increments throughout the sprint. You can even release them throughout the sprint. That's a scrum team decision, probably mainly driven by the product owner. But you can actually release multiple increments throughout the sprint. And that might make even a more rich sprint review. Because that means that the sprint review, you're not going to have to think about the potential value. In that sense, the, still the assumption of value, but you might already have an indication of the actual value that you're creating, not just the assumed value. The purpose of the sprint review is still the same, bringing all those parties together and, and look at the increment in terms of value. Yeah, so move away from the performance of the team. Let's say I, I, I sometimes use the analogy of a car. So don't stop looking at the performance of the engine, the horsepower, the whatever, how much, how much uh, uh, fuel it consumes, whatever. And as, as um, a group of people, but certainly with managers and stakeholders, maybe at your sprint review, certainly with your users, look at the road ahead. Has this sprint brought us a little bit closer to where we want to go to, where we want to get to, meaning product goal, um, living by our product vision, and so on. So th that is for me the goal of the sprint review. So um, shifting people's focus from performance to impact. That is in a way not looking at, at the scrum team or the people in the scrum zone have been performing, but looking at the potential impact, the potential value of their work. And that is for me essential. Yeah. And, and then three essential questions in that regard are, and, and um, overarching questions, if you want, regarding value. And, and again, three elements. What is your, let's say, your current value position? I call that your current or your actual value. What is, what is how much value are you actually creating, delivering? Um, what is the value position that you currently have? But more in, also important is what is your ability to sustain or even improve your current or your actual value position? So what is your ability? What is, what is your sustained value? And, and think about those things. And, and the third question is, what is your ability to discover new value? In that sense, innovate within the product, but maybe even across the product, across your portfolio, misheat across all of the services that you have. That means innovate within a product, but also across products. If, and, and then you have to address those questions. And, and um, I call them key value areas. So you see those three coming back, current value, one, 
to your ability to sustain value in that sense, I, I still call it adaptability, your ability to adapt, to change, to change direction, to improve, to uh, move on, to move forward and so on, and your ability to innovate. And if, if those are key questions and, and what I call key value ideas, then um, you want to start measuring potentially. So you want to think, what do we call value? What do we expect with value? By the way, value might be evolving throughout the life cycle of a product. A product that is really very young still, early on the market, you still think in terms of maybe lean start by these, MVPs, learning, and so on. So maybe it's not so much about money yet. Over time, it might be more about money. It might be more about customer satisfaction and so on. But at least in those three domains, you see on the screen some potential sample metrics. And I, 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 I deliberately call them samples because you have to think about this for yourself in your organization. What is the reason of existing of your organization? What is the reason of your organization adopting Scrum? What are you hoping to achieve in that sense? What does it mean for you to uh, get value from your types of complex challenges? Yeah. So you have to make up metrics for yourself. At least actual value, often something with money. Often something with uh, consumers, uh, customers, users, and so on. And, and often overlooked, I'll come back on that. I believe that introducing terms should also bring value to the people doing the work. Again, humanizing the workplace. I'll come back on that. Your, your ability to sustain value or sustain value. Um, meaning, how often can you release? How done are your increments by the end of the sprint in terms of being actually releasable or what is now called usable in the new Scrum Guide? How releasable is your work? Because a lot of organizations that I meet, I don't know whether you recognize this, um, fool themselves. They now organize all of their work in sprints. And for whatever reason, I don't know, that's, a, that's sort of, uh, sort of subfires is going around the world. Um, everybody thinks that they have to do sprints of two weeks. I, I, I don't really care, but Scrum only says no more than four weeks. And, and let me even go, go a take it a little step further. All those organizations fooling themselves by thinking, wow, our agility is great, our adaptability is enormous because we organize work in two sprints. Well, you know what, if you, hand, if you have to hand over work from one team to another team, to another department, to another department, and they all organize their work in sprints of two weeks, but in the end, it takes you 10 sprints of two weeks, then your actual ability to adapt is still pretty low. It's not every two weeks, it's every 20 weeks in my example. So think about that. And that, that might be expressed in lead cycle time, I've, I've got this parameter that I think is very important for teams um, and people. How much um, unfocused time do you have in that sense? How often are you dragged away from the work that you really want to do? How, how often are you dragged into non-value adding activities? In, in, in Scrum value terms, what is your commitment? What, do, what are you committed to? And what is your focus? And how often are you um, enforced to unfocus? Yeah. And then your ability to innovate. Um, how much dead code do you have in your product? And that dead code um, stops you from innovating because it makes sure that you have to spend a lot more time on non-value activities, like maintaining that old code, keeping it into account, uh, all the dependencies that it created, and so on. And then, and then for me, two more important, let's say more positive expressions of your ability to innovate is, is what I call feature usage, meaning what is sort of the usage index within your product? What features are being used, what are not being used? Remove the features not being used and you also resolve your dead code problem, by the way. But even beyond that, are you introducing Scrum not just to do things faster, although you might be fooling yourself, produce more, but to deliver more value faster in a way. But are you also introducing Crum so that you free up time of people that they can think about really new products? In that sense, I call that product turnover rate, like there's a feature turnover rate. Um, how, how, how much 
of new features that you really, really new innovative features that you built into your product over the past two to three years. And the same question at the product level. How, how many really new innovative products or service have you created, launched onto the market over the past two to three, four years? Because most organizations that I know are stuck in tweaking, updating, changing, and so on, uh, existing features of existing products a little bit. And they're now doing it in 10 sprints of two weeks rather than a long phase of, uh, of six months, although it might boil down to the same. So think about it, measurement. Now let, let me dive into those high, that, that area one, your actual, your current value position. Yeah. Now these are, these are metrics from two reports. And, and uh, although I like, them, I like them a lot, because they bring in a very perspective to delivering value with Scrum. That might be, uh, you see on the left-hand side, uh, it's from the Product Management Festival. It's not too long ago. Um, it's, it's something with money, customers, market share, customer satisfaction, and, you know, NPS, not promoter scores and so on. On the right-hand side, um, you see uh, the results of uh, companies with high levels of engagement, how much better they perform in terms of um, what I would call business and, and customer outcomes, which relates a lot to the two topics I've already talked about. But all, all beautiful, all great. But what about team engagement? And that is, that is so important for me about the Gallup research. They added also something with employee outcomes. So in that sense, they, they start with high levels of engagement. So organizations that have a high level of engagement, which you could call commitment in Scrum, high levels of engagement, we all know that they come from relatedness being able to relate to what you're doing, relate to the value that you're trying to deliver, that you're trying to increase. Relatedness, purpose, engagement, commitment creates focus. So, so companies that, that have a high level of relatedness, meaning people engage more, um, that means it's also better for those people themselves meaning lower absenteeism, lower turnover, less people leaving the company and so on. So, so think about those aspects. When you think about Scrum, introducing Scrum, think about what do we call value, release regularly, and then measure. And here are sample metrics at the highest level, but don't forget to combine them with the other ones. Don't forget to combine them into trends, longer term view and perspective on things. That's really, really important for me. Yeah. And then, and then I already talked about closing feedback loops. Well, if we can get people to shift their eyes from, val from volume, and volume you could call output, uh, the, the increment that you have produced, or uh, that you can put on the market, that is still output. So you have to create output, but output is not enough. You have to move from output to outcome. Yeah? So when we talk about potential value, potential impacts, you're shifting to, from output to outcome. So in that sense, you're not looking at the output alone, but you're looking at the outcome of the output, which is important. So, uh, so rather than managers um, um, interrogating people and making sure that teams justify, or individuals have to justify at the sprint review for what they've done and not done, look at them, what they did do, how much potential value that has, and, and then close the loop by making sure that you leave the sprint review, because you know, like I said a few years ago, inspection without adaptation is pointless. So inspection of value at the sprint review, great, beautiful start, but still pointless without thinking about adaptations. Yeah? So closing feedback loops all the time. So I hope that your sprint review starts with how much value, potential value, has this team or have these teams created in this sprint? Yeah? Towards answering the question, so what can we do to help those teams create even more potential or assumed value in the next sprint or the next couple of sprints? Rather than focusing again on, on, on increasing the amount, volume, the amount of output. Again, it's all about outcome. And, and, and outcome, you could say, importance, impact, value. So that, that's important. And in that sense, 
How can we facilitate the teams? So as you can see, that creates a sort of virtual feedback loop on top of the sprints that teams have, or it connects to that feedback loop at the sprint review. It gives a different meaning, a different purpose to the sprint review. So you've got this inspection adaptation loop, this feedback loop that revolves around key value indicators, your uh, current value, your ability to sustain value, so sustain value, your ability to potentially even discover new value, probably within the existing product, and that's important. And then, and then taking that servant leadership stance or position that, oh, what can we do to help you in terms of, I don't know, tools, authorization, um, get pressure overview, increase or decrease your unfocused time? What can we do to liberate you from all those non-value non -value adding activities, uh, tools, authorizations, and so on, rather than um, looking at, in terms of adaptability, if you have to organize your work in a 10 um, so subsequently organized sprints before you can deliver value to your end users or your consumers, have an impact on the market, what can you do to improve those things? So that, that's where those metrics come in at the review. They give you an indication of that current situation. It, it, it's a new data point. So it adds to the data points that you have been collected tr collecting throughout the sprint, at least minimally at the sprint review. So you can look at those trends and then think about Scrum. Will, Scrum helps you make those things transparent. The solution, the adaptation, what are you going to do about it? That's still in your hands. It depends on what you're hoping to achieve in the next couple of sprints. It might be dependent again on the, the, the life cycle phase of your product and so on. But how can we facilitate the teams to do even more? Uh, remove road blockages, remove, I don't know, uh, make sure that they've got green traffic lights all the time, that they don't get hindering, that they don't have to stop um, handover work and so on. All delays, remove waste and so on. Um, so uh, follow follow a training. Uh, thank you, Tsika Academy, by the way, for uh, uh, promoting my, my classes. That's really nice. Um, do they need to develop themselves? Do they need development tools, engineering tools? Um, have the insights into uh, most modern engineering practices and so on? Do we have good standards in place? A definition of done, by the way, makes a lot of this very insightful. Does our definition of done cover all the work, all the quality, all the criteria that we need to live up to, that we need to meet in order to call our work no later than by the end of the sprint actually releasable? Because if it's not, don't talk about philosophy until you've solved that first. I, I, I once wrote a paper about a paper, a blog note about philosophy. I said, well, as long as you're not able to deliver something releasable in one sprint, Stop talking about velocity. Your velocity is zero anyhow, because your ability to produce, to create value is zero. So think about agility in that sense, your ability to deliver value, your ability to create an impact. And let your sprint reviews revolve around that. And rather than telling people how to do that, ask questions, find out, Okay, so this is not really up to our expectations. We hope that the value that we were delivering would be higher. Rather than blaming people for that, judging them for that, assessing them for that, um, having them justify whatever, ask questions. So, okay, what might be reasons why our actual value position isn't what we were hoping for? Is that in our adaptability? Is that in the governance? Is that in the way that we have embedded and often twisted scrum within the organization? Have we set up micro scrum teams within existing silos? Um, do we have a real product only in place with a mandate, with a focus on the full product, meaning the end-to-end -end start to finish ability to deliver value to our consumers? What's the engagement of the teams? How can we improve engagement of the teams? How, we, how, how can we help them? So that you do a little bit better in the next sprint and that hopefully at some point in time you see that reflected in the trend lines that you are collecting. So, so think about it. Closing the feedback loops are a sign value so that you can regularly release and then measure the impact and use, use, the, use the result of your measurements as an indicator, uh, hopefully in trend lines of your actual situation. And, and can we sustain that value? Because even if you have a high value now, 
if your ability to sustain that value isn't really too big, then this is what you want to work on. Yeah. So a lot of things to think about. So in 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 a in short, sort of summarizing, sort of you're looking for a mindset shift towards exploratory management, meaning exploring whether you are delivering value or not. And value, very different than volume. So the mindset shift that we're looking, so exploratory management, exploration is not about imposing long-term plans of rigid targets. Rigid and rigidity is sort of the antithesis, is the opposite of agility, rigidity, uh, like deadlines. No, uh, managing for volume, meaning tasks, individual performance, and then providing extrinsic motivators, trying to bribe people with more money or a, a bonus or a, some financial incentives or so, or the status, a bigger company car, whatever, all extrinsic motivators, toxic. They have nothing to do with scarf. And that is important. So exploratory management is about creating relatedness, making sure that people within the organization, but also beyond the organization, creating ecosystems that revolve around relatedness, where people feel connected, but that they can relate to why are we doing this? Why does my organization exist? Why are we introducing Scrum? At least minimally, what are we trying to fix what, what problems, what are the biggest challenges, what are the biggest problems that we're trying to resolve by introducing Scrum? That should create relatedness. So that means having vision, expressing ambitions, but not telling people what to do. Arming for value rather than managing for volume, meaning uh, assuming value, releasing, maximizing, uh, measuring so that you can maximize, so that you can optimize your work for value and not for volume, which is very different. And in that sense, rather than providing extrinsic motivators, try to create and foster an environment where, where people find meaning again, where they are intrinsically motivated. And we know that people are intrinsically motivated by scarf, by skills or competence, by some sense of certainty. And certainty might be job certainty, it might be other things. But long, short term certainty, long term certainty, uh, where they, they have autonomy, where they can have the ability to organize and manage their own work, which relates a lot to self organization of Scrum. Remember when I showed you Scrum, we we're so stuck on thinking about the rules of Scrum and then, and then thinking about tactics to apply those rules. That is already even difficult. Now we totally forget about the, the DNA of Scrum empiricism but not just empiricism, also self-organization. And when it's about people and human behavior, the scrum value, yeah? So, so autonomy, relatedness, and fairness, being fairly paid, that creates some certainty too. So um, I'm not saying, again, and, and Daniel Pink also doesn't say that uh, money is not important. Money is important, but it's certainly not the only aspect. Um, and, and beyond money, as an extrinsic motivator, we are driven by scarf. So try to create an environment where people can relate to what you're doing, why you're introducing Scrum. Create a defined value, create metrics, think about those things, and keep closing feedback loops. It's not about prediction. It's not predictive management. It is exploratory management. You are exploring, is this working? Yes, no. Metric gives you an indication. Oh, we think it should be working. Let's give it another chance. Let's give it another shot. Yeah? Until you feel like it's really not working, do something else, change direction. So exploring what is value, what is perceived as valuable for your teams, for your consumers, for the organization in terms of uh, hopefully a positive contribution that you're trying to deliver. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much again, Xibia India, for inviting me to do the opening keynote. And, and I hope this gave you some idea, at least on my Scrum perspective on metrics, measurements, what, how, how to deal with them in an empirical environment. Um, maybe some ideas to take to your workplace. So whatever you're doing, keep learning, keep improving, keep trying to do better, keep changing, keep adapting. In that sense, that is what Scrum is all about, to help you do all of those things. So thank you 
very much for listening in. I hope you like it.